Right, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. This is Saul at Synaptic, and welcome to another one of our series of ongoing webinars that we do every month, covering different aspects of applications and benefits of our technologies. Um, we're going to allow everyone a few minutes just to settle in and join the meeting because I can see quite a few of you are filling up seats virtually now and thank you for joining us. But like uh, everyone at the moment, you're probably doing back to back Zoom and Teams calls. And so it's only polite to give people a minute to jump out of one and onto the next one. Um, so I'll probably get this going in another few minutes with everybody, please. Um, and just bear with us while more people join us so they don't miss the absolute beginning of this session. Uh, yeah, there's quite a few people still just clicking on now and joining. Um, I'll do a few housekeeping notes while we're waiting for more people to join. So if you're unfamiliar with how we do our ones on Zoom, just please note that we don't use the chat function during these calls and participants are muted, but we've got the Q&A button and we welcome people uh, posting questions up there because that allows us to track them during the call try to answer them where we can in real time. But if we can't, of course, we've got a record of it and we can get back to you afterwards and give you responses offline where we never leave a question unanswered and we never fail to follow up on any of these things because the whole point about these sessions is to make them practical and useful for your business. Um, I'm not paid just to sound good on the webinar, uh, that there's no benefit to anyone. <laughs> okay, so um, as I said, this is, uh, probably a good time there are not many too many more people now joining us so i think i'll make a start today and say officially thank you all very much for coming along um, today we wanted to talk about advanced cable monitoring techniques with you this is a different aspect of how you can deploy our technology which is all about putting remote and passive sensors out into very inaccessible locations which are difficult for humans or other technologies to access to give better visibility and control of uh, an asset's performance or utilization over time. And we're going to take you through some slides here to explain how it works. And then at the end of it, we'll give you some more information about resources and how to follow up and get in contact with us. And we'll try and leave information uh, time, sorry, at the end to do kind of a Q&A and address any consistently asked questions. Very often in these things, four or five people will ask them something so similar, it's worth grouping your questions and trying to explain things because it just means we fail, fail to explain ourselves properly. So um, let's get into the meat of this presentation. First of all, you're listening to me, Saul Matthews. I look after sales and marketing at Synaptic and I've been with the company for three years. Um, You'll be listening to me uh, doing the beginning and the end of this presentation. And in the middle of that sandwich is Chris, who is our expert monitoring business development manager. Uh, Chris has got, like me, decades of experience, although mine comes from other industries, innovating new technology products, whereas Chris's is much more dedicated to the condition monitoring of underground HV cables. Hence, we wanted to take you through our thinking on this subject. Now, we are going to rattle through a lot of things here today. So in all fairness, I wanted to leave this in the deck. We're recording this session and at the end of it all, the people who very kindly registered and gave us their time today will get a copy of this on a private YouTube channel. So you've got the time to reflect on this, watch it again and understand it again afterwards. Don't panic about taking notes and missing anything here. You will get everything. But on our website, there are a lot of other information points about applications, white papers, case studies, Technical sheets and demonstrations can be requested of the technology, so please use it. There's also a lot of video content uh, online that we can point you to. Previous recordings of other webinars are there, and there's an ongoing series of them covering multi-zone fault detection, cable fault detection, hybrid circuit protection, bus bar protection and digital substations, as well as wide area monitoring and condition monitoring applications that we get involved with in transmission and distribution, but also in renewable energy generation. Uh, which is particularly focused on offshore wind. So that said, um, let's talk about today's agenda. We want to cover with you very quickly, as limited as possible, what we are doing and how this technology is fundamentally different from other conventional monitoring technologies which are available today. Then Chris is going to take you through a little bit of information about, okay, well, what are the conventional and permanent monitoring uh, solutions that are out there today? What are they good for and where are there some challenges in their operation? And then based upon that, we can come back to how we do it slightly differently and complement them. And then that should open up a bit of a Q&A at the end. And hopefully that should take us about 40 minutes of your precious time. 
and then we'll see how we do. So um, very quickly, our company is based in Glasgow, up in Scotland, uh, and uh, we are in a unique position because we invented the world's first electromechanical measurement system, which is totally passive. That means we found a way fundamentally to measure any current or voltage without the need for power supplies, telecommunications infrastructure, data of any sort, power or batteries of any sort, and any kind of maintenance recalibration. We can get these sensors into very remote locations and bring out transmission grade accuracy information about phases and amplitudes and voltage and current measurements from lots of locations simultaneously. Because they're passive, they take up a very small footprint and they're only networked back to a central location by optical fiber, which in the case of cable systems is very often available right next door or even co-located with the phase conductors. And our mission with this technology, of course, is to do two things. Number one, it's to reduce the capital cost of instrumentation uh, for complex power systems. And then number two, it's to improve their visibility and real-time control and ultimately provide better information so you can make smarter decisions about asset management, repair and replace kind of problems. Uh, we're already working with people like Scottish Power and Scottish uh, sorry, Scottish Power and SSE networks in the UK. Um, in Europe, we've started working with transmission operators like Statnet and Red Electrica. And you'll see also we're doing some work here in offshore wind and now with railways. But they've all got one thing in common. It's about providing immediate real-time visibility of a remote asset, which otherwise is so far away that there's no access through telecommunications channels or they're simply so inaccessible under sea or underground that you can't easily get to it to find out what's going wrong and improve your control of it. And this is done because the core of our technology says we have a central interrogator, one powered intelligent device, normally in a substation where we've got a power supply and access to a data network so we can stream results. And that connects to a single standard optical fiber that optical fiber can reach out very long distances and we can daisy chain along that fiber lots and lots of sensors and that's the key technology it's not like optical cts they shouldn't be confused with that and it's not like distributed temperature sensing or acoustic sensing because what we're doing is serially multiplexing sensors and we can put up to 30 30 sensors along the same fiber and simultaneously see all of them over a distance of 60 kilometers. So it's scalable in blocks of 30 sensors per 60 kilometers. If you want 60 sensors, you take two fibers. If you want 90 sensors, you take three fibers and so on and so forth. And we can see any combination of voltage, current, temperature, vibration or strain along that array. Uh, wherever the optical fiber leads us, we can simply splice in and get a measurement back. In fact, the way we measure current and voltage is unique because we use industry standard CTs and VTs. They're the same that would be used by anyone else in any substation or any power station in the world. The trick is that on the secondary side of those devices, we've got a passive sensor that directly converts an electrical signal into a strain in the fiber. So that interrogator is illuminating with broadband light all of the sensors each of them reflect back one color of light, and that color of light is shifted slightly by whatever the current or voltage measurement is at that location. Therefore, the only thing connecting all of these sensors back to the central point are colors of light. There is no data. That's why we don't need telecoms. There is no power. Everything is done passively. We don't harvest or scavenge power to do it. So it's good that they use familiar devices. The installation techniques are familiar and it can primary or secondary connect, which is useful if you want to leverage existing instrumentation and primary transformers to obtain more measurements. It's very reliable because of course, these passive devices are simple. They self -cal calibrate for temperature effects. They're immune to electromagnetic interference and there is no maintenance or ongoing recalibration required. That's very important for operation over decades. And indeed, when we've done our lifetime accelerated testing of our devices, we've had no accuracy losses for over 140 years of operation. Um, they're very small, so our devices are fundamentally greener because there's less footprint, they're very easy to retrofit, they're passive, they're safe to fit in awkward locations, 
and the footprint being so small, the elimination of all of the surrounding active electronics, equipment, copper wiring, telecommunications, time sources, that's a significant saving in space, footprint and cost of materials to obtain high quality information from remote locations and bring it back centrally very efficiently. And indeed, that's what we eliminate. Uh, the fundamental saving here is the ability to get into small awkward spaces, uh, not spend a lot of money on civil works, and yet have uh, power free and data network free access to a lot of information that will tell you how to run your network. Now, if you've got that concept of lots of sensors over a very wide area, you'll see how it applies here, where you've got this application scenario where we stretch across and activating and enabling digital substations, instrumenting very complex wide area circuits that have multiple branches in different directions. But in terms of cables, it's more the bottom half of this screen where the traditional application for us is cable fault detection or protecting individual parts of mixed or hybrid circuits so that if you've got an overhead fault, you can allow the system to reclose because you know it's transient. If the fault is underground, you know it's a permanent fault and we can block the auto reclose commands and prevent further damage and give you a more granular post event response to a fault. But while the sensors are operational and there isn't a fault, they clearly can also be used not for protection and control, but for generating useful information to make decisions on. And that's either real time operation and things like real time thermal rating of cables, or it's a long term uh, asset management application that says, let's look at this asset over time and understand if we've got building losses or early warning signs of failure that we can capture so that we've got time to intervene before there's a catastrophic failure and improve our operations and maintenance costs. So typically we're used in subsea and in high voltage transmission systems to provide that early warning of problems and doing it with passive sensors means it's low cost and low touch. Um, now, I don't think I need to tell many of the people in the audience about this, but some of you have even already phoned us up and talked to us this week. We published a, a white paper in T&D World this week, talking in more detail and depth about these advanced cable monitoring techniques for earlier failure warnings. That's clearly been quite useful and well received. Please go and download it if you haven't done it and you want a longer read that I can give you in this time and this format. But I guess it's easy to say this, but there are a lot of operators around the world undergrounding uh, cables and creating hybrid and mixed transmission circuits for obvious reasons. It's to avoid storms, it's to avoid obstacles and urban growth and civil works. Uh, one of the customers we're working with at the moment, it's because they have to underground an HV power line to avoid a new runway of an airport. Or it's simply to improve areas of outstanding natural beauty where you don't want to spoil the view, even though it's more costly to underground, there are often very good operational reasons for doing so. But of course, that comes with challenges. Whilst you improve network resiliency, you do create other operational concerns, which is simply visibility. You don't know if there's flooding, you don't know if there's water ingress, you don't know if there's failure in the dielectric or in some kind of insulation degradation without frequent kind of manual inspection. And that's actually quite costly over time. So if we can automate that and provide real-time condition monitoring to improve that visibility and control, look at the weak spots in the cable systems, which are often the joints and link boxes and identify what needs attention, then you're directing resource at the right time to the right places for the right reason. And that's simply more efficient and effective. And that's probably the cause of this whole uh, application webinar. And so with that in mind, we felt that we couldn't go on telling you how we do things without understanding what's opportune and what's appropriate in terms of the conventional technology. So Chris is just going to take you for that for a minute and I'll rejoin you at the end of his session. Chris. Okay, uh, thank you very much Saul and hello everyone. Um, really just want to try to give an overview of these conventional systems that we see permanently uh, installed typically on a uh, high voltage uh, cable assets. So it's really to look at those in uh, more detail. So um, just to, to take you through these kind of graphics so we know what we're actually looking at here. Uh, so this represents uh, an HV cable circuit running between two substations a number of kilometers apart. It's kind of far enough to merit the, the installation of a, of a DTS system. And the gray line with the upper arrows uh, at each end are the three phase uh, of the three-phase circuit are for the, the terminations uh, at each uh, substation end. 
and the grey boxes uh, represent the linked boxes uh, at the various locations along the uh, along the route. And as in the uh, the majority um, of land-based systems, uh, the circuit comprises three single core cables. So regardless of the cable formation, whether they're laid flat or in trefoil, direct buried or in pipe, et cetera, um, current practice is that each power cable circuit tends to be installed with a fiber optic cable strapped to a single center phase cable. And the positioning of the fiber cable uh, really makes this solution very difficult to retrofit. It has to be included uh, in the design of the system you know, from the start. Um, so that cable, that sensing cable, may include multi-mode and, and single-mode fiber. At least one of those is utilized by the DTS system for temperature profiling on the surface of the HV asset. So generally on the cable, that's deemed to, you know, that, that's deemed to actually be the, the hottest core, the hottest position. So it's, it's applied to one of the three cores. Um, so DTS produces uh, effectively a history uh, of temperature versus distance versus time. So this 3D view of the asset then indicates the location of circuit bottlenecks and indeed the, the movement of those bottlenecks uh, over time. Location uh, can change uh, on that over time. Um, the thermal bottlenecks uh, effect, effectively restrict the ampacity uh, of the cable. So it's possible to examine the, the temperature profile um, of, of each bottleneck location in the time domain too. So you can actually look at a, at a fixed location and see how that temperature uh, changes over, over time. Uh, however, if parts of the circuit are, uh, are not being monitored by DTS, uh, principally the um, terminations, um, then you know that that's you know that that that's risk that is that is not being monitored. If uh, if other cores are actually not being monitored, again, uh, that's that's a risk. If we're actually looking at uh, terminations and uh, and transition joints, um, I'd suggest actually the reason why DTS is not actually being used in those locations is really due to the spatial resolution uh, of these systems. So DTS. Uh, spatial resolution is effectively its linear uh, sensitivity. So that implies that and a, a number of meters of fiber needs to be maybe three to five or six meters of fiber needs to be kind of compacted and applied at each joint, not just a, you know not just at one joint, but actually all three. And it's actually that compaction of, of fiber, uh, possibly by coiling it or having a special sensor, that may have an impact uh, on the optical budget uh, of the system. Um, you know that's affected by the quality of the splices, and that may eat into the, the DTS system's optical budget and affect the quality of measurement because you know more splices on the system is is more difficult for the, for the system to provide the uh, the resolution and and accuracy that's uh, that's required. So that optical budget is uh, that's symptomatic of whether the system is um, Raman or, or Brian uh, based uh, technology. Um, so the, the, the kind of the small physical footprint of, you know, is actually a sensor with a small physical footprint would actually be required to effectively measure uh, temperature accurately uh, on joints. So if you're not monitoring those joints, at least thermally, how can you predict their failure? And if you're not monitoring the cable through the circuit, how can you predict failure in each core? Um, you know, if only one and three is being monitored. So there is a chance that thermal runaway could occur in unmonitored cores and terminations. Regarding RTTR systems, um, they tend to operate by utilizing uh, the DTS temperature profile um, and effectively take three phase uh, uh, circuit current, uh, um, phase current RMS from SCADA. So load prediction is usually uh, based on, a, on an hourly basis. So a DTS system effectively needs to be making a, an accurate measurement at about 30 minute intervals. Um, it's a useful tool for, for modeling circuit behavior um, because ultimately RTTR systems are trying to predict the conductor temperature from the DTS temperature profiling the surface of the cable, uh, combining that with the circuit load current 
and certain assumptions that are actually made within the various RTTR models that are available um, to look at how it behaves under varying load, load conditions. Um, and it's a means of providing a, a really an online uh, risk analysis so that utilities can understand at any given time how much more current can be passed through within the operational limits uh, of the cable asset. That's pr principally that's driven by uh, maximum cable core temperature. But there are limitations um, in, in any model. And one of the most significant uh, limitations uh, with regards to uh, RTTR accuracy is accounting for the electrical induced losses uh, and hence heat losses along the length of the cable. So most RTTR systems uh, assume that these losses are fixed, or at least like a percentage of the uh, of, of the phase current, and these losses can can alter over time. And so they're actually not fixed. Um, we have inductive and capacitive changes between source and load, and that can have a, a significant bearing on on cable losses. So the proposition here is that the inclusion of dynamic uh, screen currents and phase currents can assist with more accurate modeling for improving RTTR accuracy. If we look at uh, DAS monitoring, uh, DAS technology, so this is uh, acoustic sensing. Typically systems are based on co coherent really noise, uh, detection of uh, coherent really noise, and um, systems are actually being applied more, more commonly now and typically they're actually being used for uh, third party intrusion. Um, so in terms of resolution, um, they can detect events, you know, to within 10 meters um, up to a range of maybe about 70 kilometers. Some are single channel, some are two channel. Um, but typically that, that information then is actually exchanged with security systems, whether it's access control systems uh, or CCTV. Um, you know, so it's, it's there to um protect uh the the cable from damage whilst the from third parties whilst the system is an is an operation um you know it can be fitted whatever to existing dark fibers that are cl in close proximity to the circuit the fiber doesn't need to be in direct contact with the phase conductor for intrusion detection but if the fiber is located at a distance away from the conductors its ability to detect faults will be impaired so Regarding intrusion, you know, systems are becoming relatively intelligent. Uh, they can detect and classify different events. You know, let's say if it was jackhammers, you know, on a, on a road surface for a power cable underneath the road and excavating equipment. So they're, they're trying to detect principally civil works um, too close to the cable asset and actually provide uh, notification um, of that. When it comes to fault detection, uh, the merits of it are really attributed to how it can detect an electrical cable fault by detecting audio spectra that might be associated with a particular fault mode. Um, and it's worth noting here as well that the, the audio spectrum on, uh, on DTS technology actually narrows with, the, with a longer monitoring distance. Um, so it's not a, a uniform kind of sensitivity uh, uh, across uh, its length. So changes in the audio spectrum of an electrical event, um, you know, it's not guaranteed. Um, detecting uh, electrical changes, you know, before that audio event uh, occurs, we, we think that's more important. Um, so DAS technology can assist in some occasions of location where the fault has occurred. But you know, the, the problem with that is it's it, it's past tense. You know, if the fault if the fault is audible. If the fiber is close enough to the fault, and uh, if so it can be heard uh, or detected by the cable, uh, if it can be detected and, yeah, and classified, um, then it's probably likely that the event is, uh, has occurred and uh, it's too late. Um, so our approach is identifying fault uh, by using other more relevant uh, parameters. Let's look at uh, PD monitoring. Um, PD monitoring as a service has been around for for many years. I mean, you know, there's a, there's lots of companies with varying capabilities and technology uh, monitoring a huge range of utility assets. You know, we're, I'm just looking here at 
systems as they're applied, um, permanent installed systems applied on high voltage uh, cable assets. Um, so as an observation, um, you know, fixed or, or, or permanently installed PD monitoring sl solutions are, are not generally specified by utilities. Um, PD testing is provided by cable manufacturers at production and form an integral part of their quality assurance program and, and part of normal factory acceptance testing. And again, PD testing is done on the complete circuit at site, including joints and terminations at handover, uh, and that forms an integral part of site acceptance testing. Um, so this is done to principally detect damage to the cable during installation and also defects um, introduced by maybe in the, the, the jointing process. Um, I think when it comes to permanently installed systems for H, H, um, for, for HV cables, you know, there are quite a few suppliers of such solutions and there's quite a lot of hardware required and that hardware has to be installed at like nominated link box locations uh, along the circuit route. Generally, the remote electronics communicates to the main PD monitoring hub uh, back in the substation. Generally, it's over, uh, over an available fiber, either within the, the DTS uh, cable or DAS cable, um, or through utility comms, whatever, if there happens to be uh, available, uh, available comms uh, in close parallel actually to, to the underground circuit. So the remote electronics requires power supply at the various locations, and this requires an additional LB cable, you know, to be installed, you know, energy can be harvested, you know, from the phase conductor or possibly some type of PV or local PV or, or you know, turbine solution. But, you know, it's, it's more hardware uh, to be monitored and, and, and maintained. Um, so utilities really tend, I mean, when analyzing um, cable for analysis purposes, they tend not to use PD testing uh, on its own, often using um, kind of additional alternative uh, testing methods. So it then kind of begs the question, you know, why, so, you know, what, what's preventing it actually being used, you know, as a kind of a standalone uh, and permanently installed system? Um, and I, I think that there are, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, you know, PD tests are, are complicated and data is uh, difficult to interpret. That makes it effectively very difficult to, to automate. Tests on components of production yield different results, whatever, in the field. So, you know, fingerprinting uh, can, can, can actually be quite difficult. Um, there's no real clear metric of severity and, uh, you know, sensitivity can be reduced to, to minimize kind of false positives. Um, and in terms of lastly, really, uh, in terms of time scale, PD occurs close to the point of failure, um, providing utilities really with, with little time to react of, you know, of an impending failure. And I think it's actually for these reasons that the value proposition of, uh, of permanent PD monitoring solutions equates to relatively few permanent PD monitoring sol solutions uh, installed uh, to date. Chief current monitoring, what's this? Um, well, chief current monitoring uh, solutions have been deployed really on the back of some PD monitoring systems, permanent, uh, permanently installed PD monitoring systems, um, you know, and in some cases, standalone systems. So, there, you know, there's a recognition uh, within the industry that this has a uh, capability and in certainly providing um, monitoring whatever on the, on, on the cable assets, you know, and it, the whole topic of monitoring sheath current is part of a wider kind of industry discussion. And it's, it, you know, it's getting uh, some, some, some much needed um, airtime. So it's understood that actually measuring sheath currents in relation to phase currents can provide indications of known electrical fault conditions via internal cable degradation or faults generated from, from outside the cable, like, like flooding of link boxes or disconnections, uh, you know, as a result of, uh, of corrosion or faulty work. Um, so similar to, um, you know, PD monitoring, these solutions require, you know, remote electronics uh, to be installed at the, at the locations, uh, possibly more locations than 
the PD would actually be located. Um, so again, you know, power can't be harvested. You got to get a power supply issue, and you got established comms, you know, with a remote substation. So, you know, we, we we're looking here to try to find a solution to uh, to these key uh, key issues. So, yeah, having like some uh, understanding really of the technologies currently deployed in terms of fixed or you know or permanent uh, solutions, um, it's important to really try to understand what, what failures are being reported. Um, so over the years, the NVGL um, have performed kind of failure analysis on, on all types of power equipment. And in 2015, they produced a cable report and the outcome of many investigations into the cause of, of root failures. Um, so that's, you know, across, um, you know, a total of about 170 individual cases were recorded and, and and really properly investigated, you know, in the period from about 1997 through to 2014. Um, so the vast majority of cables that were uh, tested are high voltage uh, cable, um, 36 kV and up, uh, accounting for about 60%, with the remainder uh, mostly um, MV cables. Um, an important outcome um, of the root cause analysis is the identification of required actions uh, aiming to provide, you know, uh, limitation, whatever, to avoid future failures, you know, so improving design, production, installation, testing, and uh, and, uh, and service. So um, relative information from these investigations was collected and used to create insights, um, statistics, degradation, and, and failure mechanisms. Uh, of power cables from yeah from effectively all over the world, and what they found was that the majority, um, what they found was that many of the failures were attributed to inherent, uh, somewhat hidden failures stemming from design through production and installation methods. Seventeen were uh, percent was uh, attributed to external damage from third parties, and the resulting twenty percent combined with cable aging and uh, indeed unknown sources. So. Of all those failures, the majority, you know, 69% were located in joints and terminations. So that's 32% on terminations that, quite frankly, they're, they're not monitored. They're certainly not monitored in terms of, in terms of uh, temperature, not, not, not by D DTS from my experience. So, you know that that that's you know that that in itself is actually a significant uh, uh, a significant risk, um, so you know installation methods and uh, and the like and site cleanliness and all this uh, you know contributes to to failures, um, so external contaminants and you know even the tiniest scratches on the surface of a cable can lead to um, future rupture. Um, so over the passage of time, the cable in infrastructure is subjected to the influence of its installed environment. Um, not, you know, not just related to weather, you know, rainfall and, and temperature extremes, but also its electrical environment and to some degree its mechanical environment. Um, mechanical failures can occur from you know, third party intervention, generally cable cables are being dug up, uh, disturbed by machinery. Um, you know, disturb the, these disturbances can actually affect connections and lead to ohmic overheating or whatever in joints. And one of the main accelerating uh, accelerants really in this um, degradation process is the presence of water in close proximity to the cable. In a prolonged exposure to the cable, and its kind of cyclic cyclic nature can damage the um, the outer sheath of the cable. But more relevant, actually, on 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 MD cable. Um, but you know this prolonged flooding can actually lead to corrosion and you know typically at, uh, at cable joints and uh, and terminations. The other key influence in this degradation process is is due in part to the more recent kind of increase in in, in transients and harmonics that are a byproduct of new production sources, you know, or new power generation sources. Um, you know, uh, across the grid infrastructure. So the the total environment is is dynamic and changing. And what we want to do is actually to look at how we can better monitor these assets, um, ideally passively, 
ideally accurately, uh, certainly maybe more accurately and um, effective, well, more cost effective than um, conventional uh, technologies. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, so at that point, uh, I'm going to take over the dialogue here, and I can see there's some questions ongoing here. We'll try and get around to all the questions while we're uh, continuing to talk to you, if we possibly can. If you don't get a response to us in real time, I apologise. We'll catch up with your questions. Um, so what we've seen so far is an explanation of perhaps some of the conventional techniques and limitations, and what we're just trying to do then is then cast what we do in that light. So thinking about that cost of a failure and degradation over time, which leads to a failure as a kind of a simple chart, what we're saying is we don't want to be in the top right corner. I think that's obvious to everyone. And the challenge that we've noticed is that conventional monitoring, yes, requires power, requires a lot of equipment, requires a lot of networking, but fundamentally, conventional techniques do seem to be looking at the results of degradation as opposed to the causes. So whether that's partial discharge or distributed acoustic and temperature sensing, or indeed manual scheduled inspection and just, just uh, visiting sites once or twice a year to make sure everything's okay, you're only going to look at the outside of the cable to look for a, res a failure of the insulation. And what we are trying to get to is, well, let's move this conversation to the left of this chart and let's see if we can engage earlier and buy you more time by looking at what's causing those failures. Because scheduled inspection ultimately could be cheap individually, but over time it's, inspect it's expensive and probably infrequent. They're focused on the results of these problems and there is minimal time, as Chris has been saying, before failure uh, to respond and do anything about these events. What we're suggesting is that Synaptics technology uh, is able to engage earlier see these factors sooner and therefore you're going to find that uh, it's actually going to reduce the cost or not only of the failures but the cost of monitoring. Uh, we're trying to make sure this technology is affordable as well as accurate and so we're suggesting that a better route is permanent monitoring which is synchronous so you see all of these parameters all of the time and over time so you can see trends and degradations but it's multi-point You've got lots of measure ands from lots of locations all coming into one synchronous system. So you can take a slice of time and see what is the phase current, what is the sheath current, what is the temperature at a given location and time, and look for those early warning signs of a failure, buying you that critical time to respond to an issue before it becomes a thermal runaway or a catastrophic failure. That's the idea of passive and distributed sensing. Now, Chris mentioned sheath current monitoring as an attractive way or a proxy for giving you those earlier warnings and that's true we cater for that because we're looking for the ability to monitor the progression of faults, uh, shunt faults and sheath faults that are caused by degradation at each one of those locations and there could be 10, 20 or 30 such link boxes or junctions along a complex cable system over a distance. Uh, it also offers the opportunity to automate the condition monitoring of things like voltage limiters and link boxes themselves. One of the requests we have recently was to find out if we could measure humidity as an indication of a failure of the gasket because it simply isn't sealed properly, uh, which can often happen by handling and opening and shutting while you're installing it. Uh, it could also be the case that uh, you're looking for variable sheath currents because if you know the variation in the current, then you've got much more accurate information uh, to base your calculations upon for ampacity and therefore real-time thermal rating becomes a more exact science and you have less margin for error and more precision and confidence about how to drive an asset beyond its uh, fixed specifications and operate it dynamically and yet safely of course because you've got much better information to refine the accuracy of your model. And ultimately, one of the things we've realized that's also desirable from monitoring multiple locations at the same time is this notion of comparing similar assets. So our technology is constantly capturing information electrically, thermally and mechanically about these assets. And if we were comparing, say, for example, 50 locations where uh, they could be transformers, they could be link boxes, they could be terminations, they could be phase 
uh, currents. But if you compare 50 or 100 of these things at the same time, and 99 of them have the same electrical and thermal profile, and one of them doesn't, then that comparison of similar assets says, well, let's go and visit the one that looks different or is trending out of spec, because we instantly see that, and that tells you where when and why to go and visit somewhere to deal with a problem as opposed to the scheduled maintenance philosophy that says well maybe friday afternoon is a good time to go and visit that location so condition-based maintenance of similar groups of assets is something we started with in substation monitoring of transformers and realized it applies here as well this is not ai this is not machine learning it's just saying we've got a lot of comparable and correlated and synchronous measurements in a permanent recording system that's going to see these patterns and being analyzed multiple different assets at the same time to tell you which ones are simply outliers and anomalous or out of a range that the customer sets the obvious example of that is temperature it would be trivial for us to be able to put temperature sensors directly onto terminations and see if it's overheating. Um, in offshore wind, we've already installed these systems where if you go over 80 degrees Celsius, we just create an alarm which goes straight to the control center through a 60 on 850 goose message to say, this is overheating, please reduce the power. Otherwise it will fail catastrophically and you'll have an explosion. These are instantaneous and highly reliable measurements that are able to be taken from very far away with relatively easy access and cost of installation. Um, now, Chris also mentioned electrical stress sensing. This is a subject, again, that we've learned about through our experience with subsea power cables in offshore wind. Uh, and he was talking about the, this idea of all cables in power systems simply suffering more stress than ever before. Why? Because the amount of distributed uh, generation that's happening and DERs and inverters that are coming on stream are creating so much input into the grid, which are fundamentally synthetic AC signals. And they introduce a lot of harmonics and a lot of transients and a lot of problems onto the grid. And there are some very interesting papers now coming out from in academic institutions like uh, Strathclyde University in Scotland, who are citing harmonics as a direct cause of premature aging in power cables. Uh, obviously, I think many of you will know when you see a prominent third, fifth, seventh, ninth harmonic, these are often evidence of problems, but very often you don't know where they're coming from. If you've got enough sensors, enough locations, which is what Synaptic offers, you can actually track back the origin of these har poor harmonic injections and identify the source of these inverters so that you can then actively filter them out or eliminate them with engineering interventions to avoid the exposure to the risk in the first place. But I guess what we're saying is whether there's a direct cause of premature aging or not, uh, these types of electrical stress are going to impact the insulation and cause degradation. And fortunately, we're able to capture that because as well as doing current monitoring on the phase and sheath currents, where the synaptic system is also able to capture voltages, either with primary installed devices, or we can work off of the secondary of existing VTs at either end of a circuit. So primary or secondary is possible, and we can generate up to 14.4 kilohertz data, uh, a continuous point on wave measurement of the entire waveform, all the transients, all the power quality, power flow and factors that are involved, and all those harmonics up to about the 140th harmonic we will see. And again, if you can visualize that and synchronize it by time in one system uh, live, you're going to be able to see where you're suffering from power quality effects, where you're seeing these particularly pronounced uh, harmonics and if they're trending up over time, because of course that's mechanical loss and it means you're probably, well, sorry, that's an inefficiency or a loss of power in the system, which you can then narrow down and say, where is that coming from and why is that having an effect? So we think this is very important to understand electrical stresses because these are all the factors that lead to that degradation that other technologies can monitor. And that's probably the most important thing to say here. We're not saying anything you've seen before in terms of PD or DTS is bad. In fact, what we're saying is we complement those systems and you should be doing both because they'll tell you about the integrity of the quality of the insulation along the length of the cable. But we're looking at that one third of failure cases which happen just outside of their range at the terminations where you've naturally got a weak spot in the system that we can instrument relatively simply and cost effectively to give you better information about the performance of the asset. So the architecture kind of looks like this. 
it says we've got our interrogator in the substation streaming data, which you can either elect to receive as the customer directly because you've got your own systems to interpret and include in other uh, asset management systems, or we can provide a simple web-based tool to visualize that and you can see the results and a simple kind of web-based dashboard that we call synthesis. But the idea, remember, is it's a single-ended system. At one point, we gather all that synchronous data, we correct, timestamp, publish once. So for every fiber and for every interrogation unit, which is a three unit high rack mounted server unit in the substation that we install, you are bringing together more efficiently an aggregated view of 30 locations and getting all of that waveform data and all of the harmonics. And because you've got from every source, you're understanding the true original harmonics. You're not taking an average view of the sum of all of those harmonics, because sometimes when you do that, and you're doing power quality analytics, you'll end up mistakenly looking at the aggregated or aliased view and not actually understanding what the real problem is and where it came from. So it's more granular, it's more discreet, you're capturing all the information from these locations. And again, no data, no power supplies at these remote points like link boxes where you've got a real premium on space and access to power. Um, you've got a permanent and synchronous monitoring solution, which is trying to look at more failure modes much earlier at these critical failure points. Uh, and as I say, that that's a very good thing to uh, install uh, because it's simple and maintenance free and it does complement what DTS and real-time thermal rating systems are trying to do for you because you really want both to get a full picture of what's happening with that underground cable asset. Once you've installed that and you've got that combination of phase current, sheath current, temperature or humidity, vibration where necessary, and also phase voltages, you really do get one unique view and new data sets that will help you prolong the life of this asset and get more value out of it. That's why um, right now we've already had engagements from not only offshore wind operators, but also transmission operators now who are operating, uh, for example, 400 kV circuits in uh, major cities where we're trying to provide that additional granular information and looking at these joints because power, because partial discharge was believed to be useful, but not practical from a cost and space perspective, some kind of passive and low footprint solution is better. And we hope that we will be able to give you some results from that in the near future. But today, what we wanted to bring you was the notion that this advanced cable monitoring technique is giving you that synchronous and permanent view, yet it's affordable and scalable. It covers electrical and mechanical parameters, which are critical failure modes. It is by nature of being passive, very safe and easy to retrofit. No new skills are required to splice our sensors into the existing fiber or to install it. Uh, it doesn't need to be intrusive because we can put sensors around insulated cables. Uh, it's very reliable because it's so simple. Uh, again, no power, no telecoms, no data, no maintenance, no 4G, no IoT. It's super secure because there is literally no data outside the substation, only light, which is unhackable and unspoofable and uninterruptible. And the leveraging the optical fiber gives you range, bandwidth, and a very high sampling rate. As I said, we can go up to 14.4 kilohertz to capture all of those transients and never miss anything that otherwise even PMUs wouldn't be able to see operating at four to eight kilohertz. And finally, the point of this whole conversation is to say, we, we've, we believe that we can avoid outages, which is the fundamental principle here and provide safer operational modes for the cables because we're able to get to these failure modes much earlier and know when, where, and why they're happening to you. And that's why we've got customers like uh, REE, the transmission operator of Spain, asking us to instrument uh, HV cable systems because this is a lower cost and higher visibility and resolution system than has been possible before. So I hope with that in mind, those uh, make sense to you as concepts. And at this point, when we've got just 10 minutes to go before the end, uh, I should first say thank you for everyone for listening in and understanding, and lending us your time and your ears. We've also had in the background here several questions that we should probably try to play back to the audience here. And then maybe, you know, either uh, Chris or I can answer them because there's some of them seem to be quite similar 
Um, so I'll just kick off with a few of those for everybody. And again, remember this is being recorded. So at the end of this, you'll be able to play back the whole thing on a private YouTube link to find out what was said and take notes. And hopefully you're going to be able to be inspired and engage with us in more detail on any particular needs that you've got. But one of the first question here was about high frequency CTs and do we use them? And I thought that was a very good point to make. So of course you would want to install high frequency CTs in the situation where you're trying to go up into the megahertz sampling range to detect partial discharge. Now, this is a simple trade-off. To do that, you do need power. You might need to scavenge or provide dedicated power through cables to drive one of those systems because you need processing power at the point of measurement to convert that signal and bring a data stream back to a central location. The philosophy that we are uh, taking with synaptic technology is that you don't want power, you don't want the surrounding auxiliary equipment, you don't want the copper cabling, and you don't want the dedicated telecoms infrastructure to do this in all of these small remote locations. So that's a simple trade-off. If you want to go into the megahertz range and you want partial discharge monitoring, it requires power. If you want to do it passively, we can't go that high, and actually the, the maximum uh, we can go to is about 35 kilohertz today with our technology, whilst still remaining passive and not scavenging or harvesting any power using any kind of batteries or any kind of scavenging technique. So it's really important to distinguish partial discharge monitoring in our view is important before you energize the cable to make sure that your system is appropriate for use. But once it is energized, what we're saying is running our passive sensors, even up to uh, 17 to 35 kilohertz is still good enough to see all of those critical harmonics, all of the transients, all the subsynchronous oscillations uh, in their original state, no aliasing and no aggregation of those effects, so that you can see where you've got dielectric loss, where you've got effectively leaking of current. And because you can install so many at so many locations, every 800 meters or so at joints, that's enough to point to your O&M teams where to go and engage and, and conduct some kind of inspection or repair. Um, so it is an either or thing. Uh, we don't offer HF CTs. And just to reiterate, any CTs or VTs that we use are industry standard ones. The user tells us if you want 5P class or 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 uh, class sensors, or if you've got them already installed, we will work with those uh, to get these measurements out. And that gives you enough practical early warning, we believe. So I hope that answers that particular question um, because it's a straight trade-off between wanting power and having a high footprint or not. Um, other people are also asking us to just re-explain uh, questions about uh, DTS and DAS. So I'm sorry if we were using acronyms. DTS is distributed temperature sensing. DAS is distributed acoustic sensing. And fundamentally, these techniques are, of course, using the fiber effectively as a microphone to listen along the length of a cable and look for problems with the uh, structural integrity of the insulation. And what we are trying to do is say, well, that's fine, but let's look at the load that's going through electrically those cables, because by studying those electrical stresses, you'll understand what's causing the eventual degradation of the insulation that they're picking up on. And that can only help and complement them. So that's the distinction there between the two kind of physics or, or ways we're using optical technologies to instrument these locations. Um, Okay, um, there was also a question here, sorry, just at the end, uh, I just spotted about range. We should re-emphasize that. So I said, uh, we take a standard single mode fiber and we can illuminate it up to 60 kilometers and install up to 30 sensors. Now, everything's a trade-off, of course. If you want to go further per fiber or you need more measurands than that, we can do it. There are different ways to do it. We can take a second fiber and reach further. We can amplify the signal or we can trade off on accuracy. Uh, if you don't need the full waveform data and it's more mechanical than electrical that the requirement is, but uh, there is no real minimum distance either. We've got sensors in offshore wind farms in the base of turbines, which are only, uh, gosh, under a meter apart from each other, and they work absolutely fine. The reason they work fine is because each one of them is optically addressed 
to reflect one particular wavelength of light back to the interrogator. So the interrogator is like a giant torch illuminating the array, and each sensor along the array streams back its own predefined color of light, which has plenty of gap to the next color of light. So in the light spectrum, they're clearly far apart and the physical distance doesn't matter anywhere near as so much. They don't interfere with each other's signals. We can always see up to 30 of them, that's our limit. Um, per fiber so that they don't kind of signals don't overlap each other and cause problems with the interpretation. So there is no minimum distance, but there is eventually a maximum distance because of course imperfections and noise in the fiber will eventually cause us problems, you know, seeing something that's say, for example, 200 kilometers away could be quite a challenge, but then you can always interrogate from the other side of the circuit coming into a central location through a different fiber. And there are ways and means around most of the challenges that we've uh, ever encountered. But if that uh, question had a particular follow-up and you need to know more, of course, the whole point of these seminars is to say, well, we're available to you. We'll give you a copy of this deck. We'll share all this information with you and please ask Chris or anyone in our team to follow up afterwards. You can get us on email, uh, hello at Synaptec, uh, and you can see our website domain is synapt.ec. And through that, we'll be able to engage with you and we can offer you, <coughs> excuse me, um, some dedicated webinars, uh, a free demonstration or a consultation session to understand your particular requirements and operational challenges so that we can design a system that specifically addresses the concerns that you've got, whether that's in medium to high voltage transmission or whether that's in renewable generation and underground cables or subsea cables. We've now got experience in both and we're sure we're going to be able to help you remove these problems prolong the operational life of these assets and get better yields from the assets that you've got installed by providing this more granular and accurate uh, online monitoring technology. So um, with that in mind, it's, I know it's just coming up to the hour. I think we've addressed most of the questions here. I want to therefore thank everyone who joined in and listened in to us this hour. It's greatly appreciated giving us our time. We realize how precious that is. I want to thank Chris for putting together the deck and explaining all of the state of the art of the technologies options that are out there. And I would again encourage any of you to come and get in contact with us afterwards or visit the site. As a result of this, we'll be sending emails to all of you to say thank you for your time and giving you links to this video recording afterwards so that you've got an easy way to get back in touch and ask more in-depth questions, please do. We're a small company, we're very flexible and here to help and not sell you solutions that are off the shelf, but tailor things to actually solve real problems that you've got. So please challenge us with those problems and we hope to be able to hear from you very soon. Thanks and have a wonderful evening. Goodbye now. Thank you.